This afternoon is part one. Next Sunday afternoon, same time, same place, is part two. And two weeks from today, same time, same place, is part three. And we'll go through in chronological. This is the biggest bite. This is the biggest bite. I'm going to cover the period 9600 B.C. to March 30th, 1887. 9600 B.C. to March 30th, 1887. Now for those of you looking at your watch, it won't take me that long. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Our history is divided into two sections, basically prehistoric and historic. Anybody want to venture an offering as to what the difference between the two is? One came before the other. I know. <laughs> yes. I know. Okay, Laura. Prehistoric is not recorded. Prehistoric is there's no written record. No written record. Historic means there is a written record. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. And so the first period that we have any, anything to do in this area has to do with the prehistoric period. And I included it because you need to have a complete understanding of just how we came to be where you're sitting today. When the glacier that formed many of the natural formations in our area, for instance, the river, White River, and all of the streams, um, all of the geographic figures that we have uh, in the county, it also made a deposit of very mineral rich rocks southwest of Markleville in an area that the old historians, there's two right here folks, that the old historians called the Big Lick. It's about a mile and a half southwest of Markleville. This is what it looks like today. This area was rich in mineral filled rocks some 30 feet deep deposited there by the glaciers as they began to make their side-by-side -side movement and retreated back over this area, dragging things with them and finally depositing them. That's how this arrives. This area is still full of springs that bubble forth. What makes this significant to our history is this is the first known place where both man and beast came. You know, God gave animals the good sense to know what's good for them to far, as far as eating and drinking. Right. And animals would come here to do that. Man has that same sense, but he doesn't exercise it quite as well as animals do. <laughs> this became a hunting ground for the early Native Americans who lived here, an easy place to come because the game was already here. Over time, that continued to be a famous or favorite hunting place uh, even into the historic period when the Native Americans who lived around here came to hunt not, and, and they would come to hunt, hunt animals and then after that became the, uh, the settlers that lived here. So Big Lick is really where our history begins. It's estimated that it was about 9600 BC. The Great Mound at Mounds Park we know from archaeological digs that have been done by Indiana University and Ball State University that the Great Mound itself was begun in the year 160 BC. Now you think about that. 160 years before Christ walked this earth, the Great Mound was under construction. It was constructed over a period of about 500 years as different ones worked on it, shaped it, changed it, and so the Great Mound is there today as a result of that early Native American population. We don't know their names. They weren't tribes like Sioux or Cherokee or Chickasaw or anything like that. They were unnamed to us. But we know that by archaeologists and anthropologists have given them names like the Adena people and the Hopewell people. That's based upon the culture and that's an evaluation and determination from the pottery that they found in the, in the mound itself. The early pottery was attributed to the culture of Adena people. The later pottery was attributed to a culture of people called the Hopewell people. Don't know whether you know it or not, but Mound State Park came into existence October the 7th, 1930 as a direct result of the Madison County Historical Society. 
You see there was an amusement park in Mounds Park from 1897, closed with the Labor Day weekend 1928, and they were deciding what they were going to do with the ground. The park was, was done. General Motors had just come to town, 1926-1927, in the person of Del Remy. And they were looking at that ground out there as a possible home site area. And they were going to purchase it and then subdivide it. The Madison County Historical Society says that's not going to happen. So we raised the money to buy the ground before General Motors acted. And then we in turn deeded that property to the county commissioners in Madison County who then deeded it to the state of Indiana with the provision that it be made a state park. That's how Mound State Park came into being. We have the paperwork over here of the letters that went back and forth. Interesting, our president at that time had written to the state of Indiana, he says, boy, this would be a great place for a pioneer park. Great place for a pioneer park. We could put cabins out there and we could demonstrate pioneer life. State wrote back and said, ah, that's not a good idea. We're not going to do that. Connor Prairie? <laughs> Native Americans played a big role in our development. Interesting to me is 220 years ago tomorrow. 220 years ago tomorrow, the Treaty of Greenville was executed. <laughs> At, Green, at Fort Greenville, Greenville, Ohio. This is an, a painting that hangs in the Columbus, Ohio State House depicting the event. General Mad Anthony Wayne, this is Little Turtle. The only Delaware, according to the artist, the only Delaware that's in the photograph <coughs> is this man right here. His name is Bacongahelis. Bacongahelis. That treaty was the conclusion of the war in Western Ohio that began in 1791, ended with the Battle of Fallen Timbers in Ohio in 1794, treaty was concluded in 1795, and basically the treaty said the Indians have to get out of Ohio and go somewhere. Ohio would become a state in 1800. The Miami who were already here who were already here and north of here, said to the Delaware, you may come and live along the White River. Well, the government was okay with that because the government really didn't know where they were going to send them anyway. So if they had an invitation to go and live somewhere, that was good with the Delaware, it was good with the government. So the Delaware came here in the person of Chief Anderson. Now when Chief Anderson first arrived here in 1798, three years after the treaty was concluded, the, the terms of the treaty gave the Delaware three years to leave Ohio. Chief Anderson took all three years to bring his clan over here. Now you notice I used the word clan and not the word tribe. Because in 1798, Anderson is a clan chief, not the tribal chief. Each clan had a peacetime chief, which was Anderson, and they had a wartime chief. There were three clans, so now you got six chiefs. Then you had the tribe, and they had a tribal chief and a war chief, so now you got eight chiefs. You got more chiefs than you got Indians. <laughs> That's my only joke today. I promise you. So Anderson comes here with some 15 or 16 families, it's estimated. And he locates on a place he calls Wapamensink. Wapamensink in Delaware means chestnut tree place. His village stretched from basically the St. Mary's Church all the way across to where the Madison County Jail is today and from White River back to the courthouse when it was a full village. Not in the beginning, but when it was a full village along about 1819, it was a Baptist minister, a missionary came here in 1819, and he must have done a head count because he said there's about a thousand Indians in Chief Anderson's village in 1819. That was a huge village for the Delaware, huge village. 
We know that they arrived in 1798. We're lucky. We're lucky to have this because Anderson had, well, he had 10 children, but he had three natural children. One of his natural children was a son by the name of Sir Coxie. He was the oldest. He was born in 1784, and the fortunate thing is Sir Coxie was literate. In 1784, for a Native American to be literate is very unusual, but he was literate. He knew when he was born, and in his writings that I've read, he says, I went with my father to the banks of the White River when I was 14 years old. That's 1798, so we know exactly when they arrived here. They lived here until 1821 when another treaty moved them out of the area again, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. The Delaware located along White River, beginning with, you remember the name Bacongahelis, his town was here. This is just southeast of Muncie on the Burlington Road on a place called Old Town Hill on a property that's owned, and I've been on the property by permission. My wife says I go places I shouldn't go, but I had permission to go here. <clears throat> You've all heard of the Ball Brothers. Well, they have a sister. You never hear of the sister. And she owned that property, and I got permission from that family to go on the property of the Bacongahelis town. Tedapaskett's town was where Muncie Central or Minnetrista Center is across the river from, from the uh, Muncie Central High School. Coming on down, there were a total of 14 villages clear down here to the one called Lower, Lower Delaware Town. That is in today's Broad Ripple in Indianapolis. That's where that's located. The Delaware lived in wigwams. It's a popular misconception that all Indians lived in teepees. Well, you've seen too many Western movies if you think that, because the Western Indians, those west of the Mississippi, lived in teepees. Those east of the Mississippi lived in either a wigwam or a log house. Wigwam would be more of a temporary headquarter, temporary housing. If they thought they were going to stay, then they'd live in a log house. Contrary to popular belief, here comes another joke. They, they didn't play basketball in this wigwam. I promise that's the end of them. Down along, uh, down along White River in Edgewater Park is a scene painted on one of the old 10th Street bridge abutments that shows uh, Delaware in White River spearfishing. For the 12th year, this coming September 12th and 13th, in Athletic Park will be the Anderson Town Pow Wow. Historical Society will have a presence there. Each year for the past, including this year, the, the Delaware have come back here. I've talked to several of them. This is a great, great, great grandson of Chief Anderson. This is a great, great, great grandson of Chief Anderson and is this man right here. They come back here because they consider Anderson, Indiana their homeland. That's why they come. And they come from, a lot of them, from the reservation in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. If you haven't been there, I'd really recommend you, you go. If you got children or grandchildren, don't let them miss this. This is really something. The neat thing about it is when the drums start and the dancing starts. It's mesmerizing. And if you're there when that's going on, just close your eyes and imagine that same sound coming from the Anderson Town or Wapamensink across the river in the downtown area, today's downtown that was once the village. Panorama Shopping Center is here on the right. This is a, a monument that's to the Moravian Mission historical marker. This is what it says in commemoration of the Moravian Mission uh, to the White River 1801 to 1806, that's a long story and I won't go into it other than to just to tell you that there were two missionaries and one was married so he brought his wife so we got three people, came here at the request of the Delaware in 1801 and established a missionary station out on uh, close to where the uh, Shrine Club is today. They were there for five years and four months. They came inspired and full of hope to bring the Word of God to the Delaware who had requested them to come. That's an important point. But by the time they got ready to leave, 
they felt so threatened that by their lives, for their lives, that they asked permission from the church to leave and the church granted it to them. Now ladies, Mrs. Kluge gave birth to three babies while she was here. And she took care of those babies in conditions where at night, sometimes she would flee to the woods because of her fear of Indians coming in and murdering them. If she went out in the garden in the day with the children to, to work in the garden, she always had to keep an eye open for an occasional wolf that came through. There was no Gerbers. There were no Pampers. And she raised those three babies to adulthood in this wilderness under those conditions. It's a great story. The site of that station today is in a cul-de-sac called at the end of Linwood Drive off of Panorama Heights. And yes, if you're curious, if we get a reservoir, that will be underwater. I told you the Delaware left in 1821. They left as a result of the Treaty of St. Mary's, October 3rd, 1818, conducted at St. Mary's, Ohio, wherein the United States government said to all the Native American population living in Indiana, you got to get out. You got to go somewhere. We'll provide a place for you to go. Reason being is the state had become a state officially two years before. They were wanting to settle the area. And so they wanted the Indians to leave so they could all be settled. Well, all of them agreed to it at the treaty, except the powerful Miami. The Miami said to the United States government, we're not going. And you can't do anything about it. We're, we're more powerful than you are. And they were in 1818. So the government takes a separate treaty with the Miami, and they set apart a piece of ground that they call the Great Miami Reserve. It's 763,000 plus acres. It follows its northern course as the Wabash River to Logansport. Comes down here, comes across, and back up. This little section right here is Madison County. Is Madison County. Now the rules of the game were this. If you're a Miami, you can't cross over that boundary line. And if you're a settler, you can't cross over the boundary line. Never the twain shall meet. Well, the surveyors that came through, it's an interesting story about, about the survey and all the hardships they had. But they would mark along the way either by carving in a tree, which is probably not a very lasting thing to do, but they either carved in a tree or they would set stones and they would carve on those stones, the boundary. Okay, this corner right here in Madison County, this is the boundary marker. That sets in a farm lot in Boone Township. Its original location was just through this split in the trees in another field. But the farmer was continually hitting the thing with his disc so he moved it over into his barn lot to get it out of the way. That's why it is where it is today. But if you go up to this, and carved into the side of it is government boundary marker. It was for the southeast corner of the Miami, uh, uh, tra Miami uh, Reserve. Interesting, just to conclude the story. 1840 comes, a lot of pressure on the Miami by the government to get out. Miami still don't want to go. Finally, in 1845, the government says, you're going. The Miami said, we're not. Government brought in rail trains to Peru, Indiana, and loaded the Miami on boxcars and shipped them west at their objection. How many of you heard of the Fall Creek Massacre? Jesmond West's book she wrote in 1975 that became an instant bestseller. This historical marker is on State Road 38 east of Pendleton, and it talks about the massacre of Indians. 
1824, there were nine of them murdered by white men near this spot. Men were tried, found, guilt, found guilty, and hanged. It was the first execution of white men for killing Indians. When she wrote her book, she said the massacre on Fall Creek, that's a misnomer. The massacre occurred on Deer Lick Creek, north of Markleville. The family that owned the ground at that time still owns the ground. And I was privy through a family connection to be able to see the site. They will not share that with anyone as to where the site is because they don't want, they don't want to share it with the public because they don't want people tramping on it. But I was given permission to see the site. It's in the middle of a, of a field today. Story is this. <clears throat> Ten Indians, Seneca, a few others, we don't know exactly all who, all were there. They're camping on a, on a, they came in on a weekend in March of 1824. And it's early Monday morning and there's some men in Ovid. Anybody from Ovid or New Columbus? So I'm going to offend you if you are. Okay. They got drunked up that Sunday night. One of them had had family massacred by Indians in Pennsylvania several generations back, so he had a bitterness to him. They got drunk up and they decided they would go there and wipe those Indians out. And early on Monday morning, that's exactly what they did. They killed nine of the ten, one got away. The government found out about it and said to the county officials, you've got to find those people, you've got to bring them to trial and let justice be served. Reason being was, it's 1824. Madison County has been a county for one year. The state has been a state for eight years. They wanted this area to be settled and settled peacefully. And in this area still were a lot of, we learned, Miami and other Indians and the government was afraid of an uprising. They were afraid of an uprising, a retaliatory uprising. So they said, you got to find those people. That wasn't hard to do because those men went back home and started bragging about what they'd done and they got them all but one. One got away to Ohio. Never found him. You know back then if you committed a crime, if you could get outside the local jurisdiction of the local sheriff, you were home free. There was no state police, there's no FBI. So you were home free and one man got away. The others, the others were caught, they were tried. The trial took place in the first Madison County Courthouse in Pendleton. Yes, I said courthouse in Pendleton. That's where our first county courthouse was located. Why? Because it was in the center part of Madison County. And you say to me, now wait a minute, did Pendleton slip? It's in the southern part of Madison County. At that time, Madison County included Hancock County below it. So Pendleton was the center of that county. The trial was held there. Three men were convicted and the son of one of the men. So we're talking about four people convicted. They hung one in December. In June, they bring the other three men out to Falls Park in Pendleton to hang them. They hang the two adult men and lay their bodies out in coffins with the lid off. And then the son of one of them is brought up and the noose is placed around his neck and he's looking down at dad and they're about ready to do the deed and all of a sudden there's a commotion. There's a commotion. Now if you've ever been to Falls Park, think about this. All these people to witness this execution and there's a commotion and they all turn and look and coming through what is today Falls Park is a man on horseback and he's waving a piece of paper. It's the governor of Indiana, Governor Ray. He's come from Indianapolis with a stay of execution for the boy. And he gets there in the nick of time. You see, the boy was at the massacre. He was 17. He didn't participate according to the testimony. He was just there. So the governor, governor said, we're not going to execute him. The boy was let go. He moves down to the Shelbyville area lives out his life there. We know he comes back to Pendleton one time in his adult life to visit the 
father, the parent, the graves of his father and the other perpetrators. They're buried, incidentally, in the old part of Grove Lawn Cemetery at Pendleton. Unmarked graves. Today we don't know where they're buried. On the hillside overlooking this whole scene, the hillside I'm speaking of is where the Pendleton Veterinary Clinic, you with me? That hillside that overlooks the park were hundreds, hundreds of Indians. They had come there to witness the white man's justice. And it said, when it was over, that they just nodded their head and one made a comment that he thought the white man's justice was very cruel. And that was the end of that story. This is the marker. What made it so significant was it was the first time in United States history, first time United States history, where white men were hung for killing Indians. Never happened before. The Orestes oak tree, Orestes, how many have been to Orestes? How many have seen this tree? It's a huge oak tree. People who date trees say it was begun in 1670. I don't know how you do that. Do you, do you, do you walk up and you say, how old are you? I, how, how do you do that? Well, I found out. You measure the diameter and they can tell by the growth you don't cut it down, not counting rings, not saying that. You measure the diameter and they can estimate that tree 1670. Now what makes that tree so significant to our history is this. It was witness to two things that were very significant. The first state capital of Indiana was where? Corridon. It was moved to Indianapolis because it was in the southern part of the state. It was too inconvenient. So they brought it up to the area where it is today for one primary reason. There were two navigable streams that met there, the White River and Fall Creek. Yes, Fall Creek at one time was navigable for a great, a great portion of it. They built the state capitol there. Well, okay, you got the state capitol, they, they place it there, but now you don't have any way to get people to get to it. So in 1825, they, the Indiana legislature appropri appropriates money to build state roads. And the first one they built was the Fort Wayne Trace, connecting Indianapolis to Fort Wayne. Construction was, was started at both ends to meet in the middle. I hope they knew what they were doing, but they did. It came through Arrestus. And so people in Arrestus, this tree in particular, would have witnessed the stagecoaches. Yes, I said stagecoaches that went back and forth between the two cities. The trace was 12 feet wide. They had to cut down trees to make a clearance for the stagecoach. The tree stumps had to be cut just the right height for the axle to pass over them. Too many tree stumps to pull, so you just cut them low enough that the axle would pass over it. That road was in, in use as a, as a primary road in Indiana till after the Civil War, 1867. Today, today State Road 37 pretty well follows the old Fort Wayne Trace with some, some changes to it. The other significant thing that is, is a witness for this tree, in December of 1812, the Miami and the British were aligned along the Mississippi River in Grant County. War of 1812, the British had formed an alliance with the uh, Native Americans to fight the Americans. There was a big fight getting ready to start up there, so the Miami sent runners down the, down the old uh, Indian trace that ran between the Mississippi Wall and the White River, which is today our county road 300 west. The runners came all the way to the White River and then made their way to Chief Anderson's village, met with him in the long house, the council house, which sat right up here where St. Mary sits today, and asked him if he would send his warriors to help. And Anderson said, no, not going to do that. We're, we are a peaceful people. We're not going to do that. So he didn't participate in that. He had also turned town to Cumpsey the year before same request to help with the Confederation of Indians that were going to 
throw the white man out of, out of Indiana, out of Ohio, out of Pennsylvania, and back in the Atlantic Ocean if they could do it. Anderson says we're not going to do that either. Of course, we all know that ended in the Battle of Tippecanoe, November 7th, 1811. Anderson is rewarded, rewarded by William Henry Harrison for these acts. In early 1813, Harrison says, I'm going to send troopers into this part of Indiana and we're going to wipe out all of the villages and all of the food supplies and we're going to make it so that no Indian can live up here. And so he provides for Chief Anderson in his Delaware a place on the All Glaze River at Pickway, Ohio. Anderson moves his tribe over there. They stay two years to the conclusion of the Battle of, or the War of 1812 when they come back to Central Indiana and they continue to live here until 1821. Anderson has five original churches. I call them original churches because they were in the downtown area, the five original, and we'll, we'll cover those. The oldest is the First United Methodist Church, organized in 1827. This building was erected in 1964 after the disastrous fire of December 1960. Those of you remember that. This is not the oldest church in Madison County. Any guesses? And Laura, you're, you can't do this because she heard this program the other day. Any guesses as to which church in Madison County is the longest or oldest continuously operating church? St. Mary's? St. Mary's? No. Christian Church. Christian Church? No. Episcopal Church? No. The oldest continuing church in Madison County, oldest congregation that is functioning today, is the Methodist Church in Pendleton. It started in 1823, four years before our first Methodist Church. East of Chesterfield, Across from the uh, Dairy Queen, how many of you have seen this house? This was a house that was built and owned by a man by the name of William Diltz. He, uh, he, used the, he built the house for uh, his family to live in, of course, but also it was a tavern. It was also a place to sleep. He did that because of all of the covered wagon traffic that went right by the front of his house to try to capture those settlers moving west. In one year's time in Madison County, now I don't know who set out there and counted them, a thousand covered wagons passed through our county. A thousand covered wagons going west. Mr. Diltz built this house and it is incidentally the oldest surviving brick structure in Madison County. 1836 to 1840, the state got interested in building canals. Again, we were trying to improve our ways of getting around and moving commerce. So the state appropriates $10 million in the uh, Massive Internal Improvement Act of 1836. That's what they called it. $10 million. Three and a half million was appropriated to build the Central Canal. The Central Canal was to come off of the Wabash and Erie Canal at Peru and make its way down through central Indiana, through Indianapolis, and back down into southern Indiana where it would then reconnect with the Wabash Erie Canal in southern Indiana, a distance of some 294 miles. Three and a half million was appropriated to do this. Work began in Madison County as it did throughout the state by individual contractors. By count, I think there were 87 different canal contractors. You would have a company, I would have a company, this man would have a company, and we would all bid for sections of the canal, and we would build that section. Again, hopefully it was all going to connect when it was all done. Things are going along well, except in Europe in 1837, there is a financial crisis in the banking industry, similar to the one that occurred in 2008. And it spread to the United States. And when it did, 
the state of Indiana had all of this debt out for this this canal and other improvements and the holders of the note began to call the money in. The state couldn't pay it. So the state of Indiana went bankrupt in 1839 as a result of that and all the canal work stopped. This is a section of the canal that's in Madison County. This is off of West 8th Street Road uh, in January of 2010, I had an article in the Herald Bulletin about the Central Canal. I got a couple of phone calls. One was from the owner of this property. He says, Mr. Jackson, I'd like for you to come out to my farm in the spring. He says, I want to show you what's on my property. I think it's the best evidence of canal work anywhere around in central Indiana. So I went out there. I'd have to agree with him. Of all I've seen, this is really, this is pretty neat. Uh, this is White River backed up, high, high rains, not canal water, obviously, but that's the canal. Interestingly enough, I told you they appropriated three and a half million to build this canal. When they stopped work on it in 1839, they'd already spent 19 million. And when they sold it, they sold it for $20,000. East of Anderson, this is a gem. This is a gem. This is a feeder branch. This is all the more there is to it. East of Anderson. It was originally intended to connect Anderson with Muncie. Muncie was to be connected by the Whitewater Canal that came up from Metamora which went down to the Whitewater River, which took you to Cincinnati. This was all to be interconnected. Anderson would have been the hub, the hub of all of the canal work in central Indiana. We would have been a really going place. In fact, a number of communities in our county are a result of that um, um, speculation. Alexandria, Hamilton Crossing, Victoria, Rockport, just to name a few. Pittsburgh are all Madison County communities from the past that were sprang up as a result of speculation that the canal would come through. This canal was never recorded anywhere. In 1840 the state asked all the canal workers send in the reports of what you've done and and they called it the completion report. I've read it. I've seen all of the work that was done in Madison County. Nowhere is this thing mentioned. Nowhere. I went out on this man's property to see the hydraulic canal, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. We're walking along and he keeps referring to the canal over here. And we're walking in the canal and I'm thinking, what are you talking about, the canal over here? But being polite, I listened to him. When we were done, I said, show me this canal that you're talking about. I thought I had that all. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we walked over and I stepped into this canal area right here and my jaw dropped. And I turned to him and I said, this is a second canal. And I knew exactly what it was when I saw it because it has the same footprint as does the central canal. And I said, sir, you're the only property owner in the state of Indiana that's got two canals on your property. Well, immediately he throws up his hands and he says, don't you tell anyone where this is. <clears throat> so don't ask me. I can't. I told you the first courthouse was in Pendleton. The second courthouse was moved to Anderson in 1827 due to some shenanigans that went on by politicians here and the state to pull the site of the county seat to Anderson from Pendleton. They were successful in that. <clears throat> they built a courthouse which was located uh, over on the north <coughs> east corner of 8th and, and Main, about where the Crystal Arch is today. It was a two-room courthouse, courthouse on one side, jail on the other. That served, but the community began to grow, and so they built this one in 1839. This is the jail. This sits on the site of the courthouse today. First of three courthouses on that site. 
If you ever drive through Noblesville on State Road 32, you see the Historical Society building there? That's their courthouse, old one. This one was modeled on that one. I love this picture. If it's an old settlers meeting in Alexandria, we don't know when, but we know it was in Alexandria from the labeling that came to us. Old settlers were just what it says. The first pioneers, <coughs> they would get together a couple times in the summer and they would have picnics. Men would drag out their violins. Children would play. And the whole purpose, the whole purpose was for the older people to pass the stories to the next generation. You've all done that in your family gatherings, have you not? Gone to grandma's house years ago, heard grandma and grandpa talking about the old times, and you picked that up. That's what this was all about. This tradition, as far as I can tell, was in Madison County from 1856 to 1921. Last one in 1921 was in Mounds Park. I love the picture because I, I kind of think this couple might have been getting married, the way he's dressed. Check out this beard, guys. <laughs> and look at these kids. Look at the kids over here. Great picture. West of Anderson, almost the Hamilton County line, is a dam in the river. The dam was put in in 1835, and it's still there. I just took this picture not too long ago. It's still there. You can barely see it, but this is it right here. And you see these poles coming up out of the water. Well, they've been, the current of the water has bent them over, but at one time they were upright, as was another series of poles here that extended clear across the river, and they were filled with rocks. And the purpose of that was, was to build a dam to dam up the water so that the man who built it could take this body of water and have it flow into his mill. Now what makes this kind of neat is this story. The little area there where this mill was was just a stopping place in the road, but commerce began to develop around the fact that this mill was there. The town founders said, you know, he's done so much for our town. Let's name it after him. So they write out all the appropriate paperwork and they take it up to the, the clerk's office, the Madison County Courthouse, and they fill it all out. <clears throat> and they're going to call it Parkinsville. But in the transcribing of the paperwork, the A became an E. And that's why we have Perkinsville today. St. Mary's Catholic Church was the second church organized here, 1837. This building that we see here that's there now was built in 1893. The uh, Irish canal workers here in 1837, some were Protestant, some were Catholic. The Catholics wanted some priests here to conduct services for them, so they contacted the diocese in Fort Wayne. Diocese sent down two priests. There was no place to hold church, so on Sunday mornings, they held church in Mr. Farrader's tavern, which was at the southeast corner of 9th and Central. As I told you, the canal went belly up, and the canal workers left, but the church stayed. And we have St. Mary's Church today as a result of that. <coughs> Down near Ovid is the Morris Gilmore House, built in 1838. I got a call from this man. He said, Mr. Jackson, would you come down? He'd like to show you my house. I know you're doing some work on Ovid. I've heard about it. I said, I'll be glad to. So I went down. He took me in. It's a three-room house. Fellas, in the basement, the floor joists are tree trunks with the bark still on them. With the bark still on them. Ladies, this is a three-room house, one bedroom, parlor, kitchen in the back. Mr. and Mrs. Gilmore had 13 children. <laughs> Mrs. Gilmore had a rule. Mrs. Gilmore had a rule. She didn't want those children in her parlor messing it up, so they had to stay out of the parlor. Where did they go? They're not here, I can't ask them. 
Now the man that owns the house now, he's the third owner. First one outside the Gilmore family. He raised eight children in that house. He's got another bedroom on there now. Frederick Bronenberg House in Mound State Park, circa 1840. We owe Mr. Bronenberg a great debt of gratitude because when he built this house in 1840 on Mounds, what is today Mounds Park, at that time the trees, all the trees that were there today, very few trees. And he could see from his second story window the mound. And anybody that got out on the mound, he'd go out and shoo them off. Because as we all know, foot traffic on earthworks breaks the earthworks down. So we as citizens of the county today that enjoy the park, we have a deep, great deal of gratitude to pay to Mr. Bronenberg, who incidentally was the son of Bronenberg, Frederick Bronenberg Sr., the first to come to Madison County in that family line. <coughs> Raise, show of hands, any Bronenberg descendants here? Wow, I always get a Bronenberg. I've always said that's the most prolific bunch in Madison County's history. <laughs> Development. Indianapolis Bell Fountain Railroad arrives in Pendleton on December the 11th, 1850 from Indianapolis. Now this picture was taken, I'm told, about 1907, but it shows you Pendleton. This lady here looks like Ma Kettle to me. <laughs> Would you agree? The railroad was built in sections. The first section, as I said, from Indianapolis to Pendleton, completed in uh, December 11th, 1850. They then had an engineering problem. To cross Fall Creek Valley, they had to come up with some way to do it to get the railroad across Fall Creek Valley. Had two choices. Number one, you could fill the valley in and just build a bridge over the creek. Or number two, you could build a bridge that would cover the whole expanse. They opted for option two, and this is the bridge they built. You'll notice the falls at Pendleton. That at its time was the longest covered railroad bridge in Indiana. It was opened in 1851, allowing trains to then proceed to Anderson. First train arrives here June 19, 1851. They then go on to Chesterfield and on east from there. First Presbyterian Church is the third one organized in Anderson, 1851. They used to be downtown. They used to be right here where um, Cabbage Rose is located. Not in that building because the building they were in then became a livery stable. After the Baptists used it, then it became a livery stable, and then it caught fire and burned, and this building was built after that. Presbyterians then moved over to 9th and Jackson on the southeast corner, and they were there till 1904. And they moved out and moved on down to the present site. Interesting story. The church steeple on their building at 9th and Jackson, they liked it so well they didn't want to relinquish it. So when they built the new building that's there today, they took the steeple off of the church at 9th and Jackson, put it on a wagon, horse-drawn wagon, and moved it down the street, and somehow got it up on top of the church. And that's it right there. This shows you the arrival of the, or depicting the arrival of the second railroad in Madison County, the Panhandle. You all may remember it as the Pennsylvania. It pulls in here on July 4th, 1855, and oh, what a day that was. People came for days ahead of that to Anderson to see this locomotive come to Anderson. And they picnicked all around the area. And if any of you saw my article this morning on the groves of Anderson, and I told you about Ruddles Grove over in Park Place, they picnicked along Ruddles Grove. They picnicked there where East or West Maplewood Cemetery is just to see the train come to Anderson. Central Christian Church organized 1858. This building erected in 1900. Did you know, did you know that the first Methodist church, the one that burned in December of 1860, 1960, was modeled after this building? Almost a duplicate of it. 
Camp Stillwell. Camp Stillwell was a Civil War training camp located on Anderson Country Club grounds. It operated from August to October of 1861. The 34th Indiana and half of the 47th Indiana were trained there. The 34th Indiana gained some distinction in the Civil War because when it left here and it went south to fight, it's the only Union regiment in the Civil War. The only Union regiment in the Civil War to never lose a fight until the last one. And the last one was fought a month and four days after Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Virginia. You see, they didn't have cell phones. <laughs> so word didn't get out to Brownsville, Texas that the war was over and they had a fight and the last Civil War, Union Civil War soldier killed in the Civil War was with the 34th Indiana. He's from Jay County. Killbuck Mill, 1862. How many have heard of the Killbuck Mill? Killbuck Mill, you know where Frisch's is? You know where Maxwell's trim shop is across the way? Maxwell's trim shop is built on the site of the mill. And if you go in there and you talk to them, they'll tell you that in the floor of Maxwell's trim shop, when they had to do some work on it several years ago, and they had to dig it up, in the floor was some of the machinery that operated this mill. Built in 1862, it was originally to be a flouring mill. Later, it also became a sawmill. The water to power it was brought in off of Kilbuck Creek in a mill race that was hand dug by the owner, 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet of a mill race dug by hand to bring the water in. The water came in at this corner, dropped seven feet onto a turbine. That turbine then whirled with the force of the water on it. With the shaft in the center of it, it went up through the flooring and it turned wheels and pulleys and gears. And that's how the mill operated. It sat there until shortly after World War II. Not as a mill, but as a warehouse. You've probably all, all seen the historical marker for the Grunewald House. Grunewald House is a beautiful place. You know, it was built in two sections. The back section first, the, second, the front section second. As far as I know, in the downtown area, that's the oldest brick home. The one across the street, the uh, attic, the attic for the, uh, that's 1875. Of course, the city of Anderson is going to celebrate its sesquicentennial 150th birthday, the 28th of August. And I hope you'll all participate in a lot of the events that are going on. You're participating, participating in one of them right now. Down at Pendleton in 1865 was a stone woolen factory and grist mill. Obviously, it's a lot colder that day than it is today. Notice this man. It appears to me that he's got some kind of a pole in his hand, and he's probably breaking the ice in the mill race so that the water will continue to flow over to the mill to operate the machinery. If the water freezes, it stops, you don't operate the machinery. How many of you ever gone swimming in Falls Park? Where the big cataract is today, that's it. I talked about the hydraulic canal. In 1868, a group of Anderson businessmen and the city of Anderson decided that they would invest in what they called the hydraulic canal. It was a canal that was to begin at Daleville and travel eight miles from Daleville to Anderson on the north side of the river. It was not your canal built to haul commerce on. It was built strictly for its power hydraulic power because you see Daleville sits some 40 feet higher than does Anderson. That's why the people of Daleville look down on Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did it again, didn't I? Did it again. I did it again. I did it again. No, that's a fact. So you had a drop in the you had drop in water. 
This is the beginning of the canal right off of White River, north of Daleville, and I found this. I knew it had to start somewhere, so one day I took Google Earth and I'm following up White River thinking, where on earth would that dam have been? And I come to a big oxbow in the White River above Daleville. And going across the, the apex of the crossbow is a straight line, a wood line. That's unusual to be straight and be natural. Had to be man-made, reasoned I. So I got in the car and I drove over there. And I got out of the car, went up to the door of the person who owned the property. And I said, sir, I'm so-and-so and I would like to check out uh, the back of your property. Here's the reason why. And he says, no problem, just don't drive on my beans. So I didn't. But I went down there and not only did I find this, but when I turned around, the river's behind me. When I turned around in the river, in the river today, is the remnant of the old dam that they used to back up the water to turn it on and come into here. Story is this. July 4th, 1874. Big day. Big day. They're going to turn the water on. And it's going to come flowing down here to Anderson and all these sites of, of uh, factories and mills that were in the planning that would, tr it, the power, the water power would turn all of their machinery. Everybody's there to see it. They open the gate. In comes the water. And shortly thereafter, the sides wash in. So they shut her down, they make necessary repairs, and they open it again. Several days later, same result. So the, investments, the investors walked away from it to the tune of $60,000, and the city walked away from it to the tune of $20,000. So $80,000 was invested in something that never happened. Hydraulic canal. You can see remnants of it today. If you go to Park Place, you know where Grand Avenue is in Park Place? Grand Avenue cuts across Park Place, does it not? It's not a north, south, east, west road. It is a diagonal. The diagonal is the old hydraulic canal. They just filled it in and paved it. This is the earliest known map that we have of our city, dated 1871. This is the St. Mary's Church. And this is the Norton Brewery, site of today's jail. But see the bluff here? That's one continuous level, and then you have the river bluff. That's what our city was like at that time. Central Avenue that we have today is graded down. This used to be <coughs> one continuous plane from St. Mary's Church to what is the Madison County Jail. And the Indian village was on the bluff, and it was also in the lower area, although most of it was on the bluff because the Indians were smart enough to not build something in a floodplain. The fifth church in our list of churches is First Baptist. It was organized in 1872, and this building was erected in, in 1996. The Moss Island Mill, also a result originally of canal construction, man by the name of Joseph Mullinex first builds the Moss Island Mill in 1836. How many of you remember the site of the old Moss Island Mill? I don't imagine any of you remember the Moss Island Mill, but you remember the site of it. There was a cider place out there, I think, at one time. Is that right, Dick? He has a great idea. I'm going to put a mill on that site. They're going to build the Central Canal across White River. I'm going to be able to grind my grain and I'm going to be able to load it on the canal barges and if it goes south it will eventually make its way to New Orleans. If it goes north it will eventually make its way through Lake Erie, Lake Erie and the Erie Canal down the Hudson River to New York City. Pretty smart guy. Problem was, as we learned earlier, the canal was never finished. So he, can, he, he resigns himself to grinding grain for the local farmers and that's what he does. But in 1873, the mill burns, and the, this mill that you see pictured here is built in 1875. The Moss family operated it. There were some 17 different owners and operators of the mill over its, over its years. It finally was dismantled in 1935. Picture of our city in uh, 1876, you can see the corporate limits. 
That's all the bigger our city was in 1876. Only three wards. I love this photograph. As far as I can tell, <clears throat> when you blow this up, this is the photographer who took the picture. This is the old Moss Island Bridge. How many remember the Moss Island Bridge? Well, you don't remember that one. You don't remember that one. But you remember the old concrete Moss Island Bridge? It was so narrow that you couldn't, you couldn't cross, two cars couldn't cross. Well, this is the one that preceded this, preceded that. This is a bowstring bridge, the bow. The higher bow is over the river. The lower bow is over the ground. Look at the people posing for the photographer. The photographer was active in Anderson in the 1870s. Was that in Harvey? No. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey shaking his head yes. I may have seen this Riley place. 8th and Morton. You ever wonder where it got its name? James Wickham Riley. Reason being, Riley used to reside in a boarding house owned by some people by the name of Ethel on that corner. And he also worked for Mr. Ethel in his sign painting company, which was in the basement of the old Frisch's, downtown Frisch's. But while Riley lived here for about four years, he worked for the Anderson Democrat as a reporter. In his spare time, he jotted down poetry. He sent some of that poetry over to Kokomo to a newspaper to have it published. People in Kokomo went wild over this poetry and demanded to know who the author was. It was finally revealed that it was James Whitcomb Riley. The paper said to him, you can't work here anymore. You're, you're spending too much time writing poetry and not doing paperwork. So he goes back to Greenfield and we now have the beginnings of the Hoosier poet. But that's why that's called Riley Place. That's the old Gwynn Canada drugstore, if you remember that, at 8th and Morton. Nothing significant about this house. I just think it's neat. Uh, my wife and I have been in it. Uh, built in 1879. It's right across the street from the Riley Place on 8th Street. Yes, there is a convincing argument a convincing argument that can be made that Billy the Kid was from Anderson, Indiana. The story is this. In 1902, in Grant County, New Mexico, Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico, a sheriff, a former sheriff, was interviewed by the local newspaper in 1902. The occasion was this. Pat Garrett had just been named the controller of the El Paso port. Pat Garrett, if you know your U.S. history, was the Marshal U.S. Sheriff that shot and killed Billy the Kid. The sheriff who they interviewed about this story, because not only did the sheriff know Pat Garrett, the sheriff knew Billy the Kid better than any other person. Because when Billy's mother moved to that city in New Mexico, she brought with her her two young sons and her, her husband, her second husband, she contracts tuberculosis and she passes away. Oh, Phone's still on. I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the stepfather is not interested in raising the boys and he just goes off. And so here's these two young boys, 12, 14 years old, are just left on their own. So the sheriff the sheriff takes pity on Billy. His name is William Henry McCarty. He takes pity on him and he says, come down here to the sheriff's office and you can work for me doing odd jobs. 
And so Billy did. And he befriended him. And he became the really only father figure he ever had in life. <coughs> Billy went the wrong way one day. And history tells us that he was the most ruthless and famous of all the Old West bad guys. Fast, fast forward to 1902, this same sheriff who knew Billy better than anyone was being interviewed. And the reporter says to him, he says, well, did you know Billy the Kid? I knew him well. He says, I knew him better than anyone. He said, uh, what can you tell him? Tell us about him. And the sheriff said, well, his real name was William Henry McCarty. And he was born in Anderson, Indiana. Now, there's no proof of that. Because we had a fire in our courthouse December 10th, 1880 and burned up all of our records. Billy would have been born, we think, just after the 1860 census. The family was en route to Wichita, Kansas when the 1870 census was taken. And by the time the 1880 census was taken, he was an outlaw. And he's sure not going to be enumerated in a census. So there's no record of Billy. But that's a pretty good argument if the sheriff knew from what the mother told him and what Billy told him that he was born in Anderson, Indiana. I'm good with that. Only known picture of Billy. That's our fourth courthouse, 1885. It was built after the fire in the uh, courthouse number three. We had it till 1973. And now we have the one that we have today. Doxy Music Hall, downtown Anderson, 1885-1893. It was an opera house. Look at the architecture of this thing. Look at the architecture of this thing. It was at 927 Meridian Street in the lot that's next to the PNC Bank. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Show of hands. How many of you were living in Anderson in, in the 1960s? A lot of you. You've all been in that building because that is the former banner store. Do you remember how the floors creaked when you went in the banner store? That's the old Doxy Music Hall. Their story has been in the paper many, many times. I'll just tell you a little side story that I know about it. These are the Hilligoss children, Charlie Ingersoll and his daughter is, is a sister, Gertrude Pauline. These sayings are what is inscribed below the uh, statues. They were the son and daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Hilligoss. He was a doctor. Charlie apparently was really a good student because he graduates from LaPelle High School, valedictorian, age 15. His sister had contracted a fever and died before Charlie graduated from high school. So Charlie now is the couple's only son. He goes to Purdue and he contracts some kind of a disease. Purdue University calls his dad and says, Doctor, you need to come up here and tend to your son. We can't do anything with him. The doctor goes up, brings his son home, and Charlie doesn't make it. The family has these two statues executed in Italy. They are Italian marble. My dad told me he arrived in Anderson in 1929. And he told me that the old timers that he knew in 1929 told him that every Sunday afternoon, 52 Sundays a year, the Hillegosses would pull up in their horse and buggy on Grand Avenue out in front of these statues and spend the entire afternoon with their children. Final slide today. Final slide is this one. 
I just picked this one at random to show you at one time in our county, 1900 to be specific, there were 141 one-room schoolhouses. That's not counting the schools in Anderson and Alexandria and Elwood and Pendleton and Summitville. I'm talking about the county, one-room schoolhouses, 141 of them. This is one of them, called the Fairview Summers School. The picture is dated according to whoever wrote on it, June 14, 1925. It shows a homecoming, as it says, and you notice the little kids all the way to the adults in the back. Obviously, it's some kind of a, uh, a gathering, probably of former students of the school. But I show it to you for this reason. In the county, in those years, if you had a social gathering, you had it at the school. Always. You never, ever had a social gathering at church. Church was for religious purposes only. No social gatherings. So they were done at the school. So the school became central to the area for these kind of gatherings. Today, in the city of Anderson, there are three of these still standing. Well, wait a minute. Two. Two still standing. Two one-room schoolhouses still standing. One has been converted, built, on, built and added on to, to the point where you can't, uh, take it back, there are three. You can't tell that it was a schoolhouse, but it's the old Tollgate School that's set out at the corner of Alexandria Pike and Lindbergh Road. The second one-room schoolhouse, if you go over here to Brown, Delaware, and you take it all the way south to 29th Street, Countryside nursing home is over here. Straight across 29th Street, you go back to Denny Field. You with me? Right beside that road going back to Denny Field is a house. So it's kind of elevated. That is the old Smoky Row or Brown Street School. One day, I had an exhibition back here, a photograph exhibition of all the old schoolhouses. A couple comes in and they walk up to my picture of the Brown School and they say, that's our house. I said, really? She said, yes, we live there today. I said, you live at 29th and Brown? Yes. She said, I said, what's it like inside? She said, well now when you walk up on the porch of our house, probably can't picture that, but I know you're all going to leave here and drive out there. When you walk up on the porch and you walk in their front door, you're walking in what was the attic of the school, is the first floor of their house. When you go down in their basement, the basement is L-shaped, that's the old school. The other school that still stands is on West 38th Street, about uh, eighth to maybe a third of a mile, eighth to a quarter a mile, back from Park Road on the north side of 38th Street, called the Eggman School. And next Sunday, we'll cover the gas boom to World War I. That's a really short period of time, but boy, is it filled with some really neat stuff.